Yeah. Right. I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, thank you all for coming to the last uh, Global Change seminar for the, the semester. Um, so far, we've covered a bunch of topics from hurricanes to biodiversity, and now um, covering a range of, of impacts to North Carolina and to agriculture in particular, of um, some different uh, global change forces, climate change. Um, We've got three three good speakers lined up here. Um, Dr. Robert Mera is going to start us off with an up-to-date discussion of uh, climate change impacts and some extreme events in North Carolina. Um, Dr. Eric Edwards talk about some of the um, impacts of those events on agriculture and economics of agriculture. And then some, uh, Dr. Ken Berkey will talk about some recent efforts to adapt some of our crops to uh, some global change forcings like uh, stress and ozone. Um, so first off, uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Robert Mary here to start us off. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's exciting I haven't uh, done a talk outside of my classroom for a while. Uh, so it's cool to be here. So today I'm going to be talking about um, some of the extreme events of uh, global change. I will have um, a lot of material on North Carolina, but I do want to spread it out because this is a, a global change um, deal today. Uh, so we start with sea level rise, and uh, this is a pretty clear signal of climate change, and, and uh, we can divide, uh, divide its uh, attribution due to the uh, thermal expansion of the ocean uh, and melting of the glaciers on the, uh, the continents and as well as Greenland and Antarctica. And uh, our local impacts here are obviously on wildlife uh, erosion, saltwater intrusion, which is very clear in the changes to, uh, in the water table and increased salinity potential and in the future. And uh, if you're in my classes, you know I like to touch on uh, current events and put them in perspective of what's going on with our global climate. Uh, I want to focus on a storm uh, that occurred recently, November 16th through the 18th. It was a coastal storm, and it formed off the coast of South Carolina, went up to North, North Carolina, and eventually became a, a north, nor'easter. And at one point, it actually kind of had uh, tropical characteristics, but it was very briefly, and it was never um, classified as neither tropical or subtropical. Uh, but the reason I'm putting this here is because there was uh, some extensive flooding and beach erosion. As we can see in Topsail Beach, this is before uh, and after the storm, lots of the beach is gone. Uh, this, a little bit closer to home, not necessarily Raleigh, uh, but um, my family and I, we have an oyster farm over here north of Davis, a um, place called Oyster Creek. And uh, my brother went out there to check on the farm on the 19th. So after this storm had gone through, and you see in the top left, that is the road and maybe the sea. It's like right there. Um, that's another picture over here on the, on the right, what it, what it was looking like that day. Uh, and that's what it's supposed to look like when I went through November 30th. That's actually high tide. And uh, this flooding on the top is higher than uh, that than king tides have uh, been in the past. And the reason I know that is because, um, and the reason this matters is that the natives there um, have told us that uh, they have never seen flooding like this. Um, top left, that's the, the little building that is an oyster seed uh, growing facility. Uh, they got destroyed by Florence and it got flooded this time around. That's what it's supposed to look like on the, on the top right. This is the bottom. This is the road that leads to uh, some property that we have. That's what it was looking like on November 19th. You couldn't even tell if there's a road there. Um, so that's sea level rise. And in terms of uh, heavy precipitation, which really affects us here in North Carolina, uh, in fact, the Southeast has seen a, a, a change of 27% uh, from the uh, climate period of, of uh, 1901 through 1960 from the National Climate Assessment. And overall, the uh, observed trend is uh, up here on the right. Um, high precipitation now in the 2000s, 
it was um, about 40% relative to um, the relative of the events. And this does not include the, the recent decade. I am assuming it'll be higher than that, especially given the recent hurricanes. And on that note, I know this is not North Carolina, but it's relevant. Um, this was Hurricane Harvey. Uh, and of course, the, the huge amounts of rain that had dropped in parts of Texas in and around Houston and Beaumont. And uh, the, the thing about Harvey is that it was a very slow moving storm. And this is actually kind of, we, we um, Dr. Iyer, when we came earlier this semester, we talked about hurricanes slowing down. And I just wanted to kind of uh, re-highlight that because it matters uh, to us here. Uh, and then from a climate perspective, um, the, um, NOAA releases these summaries for each, for, uh, each month as far as uh, precipitation and uh, temperature. And on the left is uh, uh, the, the, the precipitation from an average, and you'll note the huge green spot that is where Harvey uh, occurred. And on the right is the ranking of all of the different uh, um, statewide precipitation range. Uh, anyway, so Texas, of course, was the record wettest in that year for um, obvious reasons. Here, Florence was also a uh, slow-moving hurricane, and uh, it very much uh, uh, devastated a lot of eastern North Carolina, but um, a lot of the rain actually fell in and around Wilmington, which is where my, my kids live, and they could not go back to school for two weeks. Of course, Wilmington was just an island for a while, um, which was just, just very sad. Uh, thankfully, their house was okay. Um, but also, I want to note the rain in and around Moorhead City and up the coast, Newburn, of course, uh, got completely flooded. And our uh, oyster farm, uh, we lost a lot uh, due to that storm. Um, but it wasn't nearly as flooded as this uh, recent storm. And, and this was more of a rain event. Uh, the recent storm was more of a storm surge um, type deal. But putting it into climate perspective, I want you to notice two things. First, North Carolina isn't, didn't hit a record uh, the, that year, uh, last year for September, uh, even though we had horns. Um, instead, Texas set a record. There were no tropical systems. They just had very heavy rain. Also of note is the fact that California uh, was extremely dry during the month of September, and we know that we had uh, wildfires. Um, that year. And this year, we, so far we have seen uh, our record wettest year for many of the states in the Midwest. We've been about normal here. Uh, and that's just some perspective. Uh, so what Hurricane Florida did was uh, really uh, damage agriculture, killing 2.4 million chickens and turkeys, which is just sad. Um, and also the toxic waste, which was a major challenge, uh, not just waste from the animals, but also coal ash, I believe. Um, and of course, the shellfish industry, uh, some folks lost up to 99% of their crops. Um, we had a, a decent uh, loss ourselves. Um, and now I want to kind of turn to a, a different variable. I want to go to temperature now, since it's been very cold. Um, very early on in the season, not just for, for us here, but for uh, a lot of the United States. This is a picture um, close to, uh, right north of New Orleans um, in was it, 2017, I believe, when I was fly flying over um, uh, um, the city. And this was weird. I grew up in New Orleans. It never snowed. So what's going on since we are um, have a warming planet and also very much a warming Arctic. And these things are related. And of course, there is a significant um, risk to uh, certain crops. This is like highlighted here. And uh, also on that note, and the reason I'm calling this tale of ice and fire, not related to Game of Thrones, is actually <laughs> what's happening. Um, I guess it could. But anyway, so um, the wildfire risk due to climate change uh, is due to the forest uh, being drier for longer and also the ice uh, melting sooner. And the uh, 
forest fires have uh, increased basically the, or wildfires basically year round. Um, and uh, one of the, um, one of the important aspects of this is that the bark beetle uh, is taking advantage of this dry climate and is causing more devastation in the forest. And I know this beetle is uh, not just in the west coast, so uh, it's relevant elsewhere. Um, now, the wildfires um, were, um, I would say, made worse, made more intense uh, because of the extreme winds uh, due to a very uh, strong high pressure system over the western United States and low pressure system off the coast because the waters are warm. Uh, and it was, in fact, record breaking cold. Before, I'm just going to show you this. The warm blob remains uh, in 2019. This was uh, found in 2016 to uh, be caused um, by uh, climate change. The, the researchers could not find uh, something like this, this type of heat wave in, uh, the, um, in anything in natural variability right, in the past. Um, and kind of like another way to look at this year in the setup for um, for the wildfires. Uh, very cold in the western US, also very, very dry in California. Um, and in fact, the record cold was set uh, in the state of Idaho. And then so far this year, we here in North Carolina, we are close to setting another record. I believe we set a record last year. So this would be the uh, last year's record, although it's been pretty cool this month. And so maybe we'll be second. Uh, and this is how cold it was. Um, Utah set a record low, negative 35. Denver also a quarter of the month of October. Um, Denver also set a record cold, um, high temperature at 18 degrees on the 29th of October. Oops. Florida was very, very warm during that time. I believe it was decently warm here too. And do remember that we had record um, highs in the beginning of October, which is very unusual uh, here in uh, North Carolina. Now, uh, well, this relates to everywhere in, in the world uh, when it comes to climate change, including us here. Um, I, I call it follow the ice. So instead of follow the money, this is follow the ice. Where is the ice north of Alaska? This is the Chukchi Sea. Um, this is north of Alaska. It's supposed to be snow covered at this point. It is dark blue. There's no ice. Um, in fact, October set a record for the lowest sea ice extent, being out 2012, where um, the, 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 the entirety of the um, Arctic um, sea ice had set a record. Um, this is, you know, in the top or on, the, on the right of so much ice is missing, basically at zero. And now it's actually starting to form, uh, has recovered. But it clearly had uh, what we think is an impact. Um, so Arctic sea ice depletion could be connected to highly anomalous northward excursion of the jet stream. Uh, and more scientists are beginning to see this link uh, between the ice that's lost in sea ice and storm systems in uh, uh, the mid-latitudes, which includes the cold blast that we have seen here, um, early snows, like uh, happened a few years back, actually yeah, two years back. And um, so the reason for this is, is because of the, of the Arctic implication, uh, how fast the Arctic is uh, warming up, the difference in temperature between the Arctic and um, the tropics is, uh, getting lower. And so um, you need a, a, a strong difference in temperatures, creates a very strong jet stream, which keeps the cold air in the north. A, a weaker difference in temperature gives you a wavier jet stream. So we get really cold air coming down here into uh, North Carolina and a warmer Arctic. And I know that has some, some impacts on uh, wildlife if uh, a cold blast comes in earlier than we expect, and also uh, in terms of um, agriculture. And so that's how it relates to uh, today. Um, and finally, yes, it's been cold here in November, but the entire world just 
tie the record for the coldest November, I mean the warmest November um, worldwide in the observational uh, period. This is from the ECMW. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. How much of a loss is the Sixty percent. Yeah. Uh, we didn't think that it was that bad until we ran out in midsummer and didn't sell anymore. Yeah. So it's pretty bad. Some people lost ninety nine percent of it. There, do you think like selfish operations like that are going to have to move to different locations? Are there like yeah. regulatory issues? There are. Um, I think they're working on that because I and last time there was a uh, there was a talk we a couple of talks about that here about like uh, um, storm surges and how that affects certain parts of the environment. And yeah, I was thinking there are just some areas that should not. Um, have any more growing oysters in because they just get destroyed all the time now. Um, we were actually lucky in in the way that I guess the uh, um, the coastline is uh, right there are oyster operations, but other people aren't as lucky. Anybody else? So, when is it that causes the mortality when you have a storm? It's like sudden change of windy or set of um, it's a mixture of things. It's uh, freshwater oysters don't really like freshwater, and obviously toxins. But uh, just to put it simply, um, in Louisiana this year, there's been so much outflow that most of their crop is just gone, and so it was just all of the freshwater uh, that drained out because it rained so much uh, that just that killed the oysters, and also because we couldn't, we have floating bags, we couldn't just let them sit, we had to sink them. And so I'm sure that disturbance there probably you know, uh, stunted their growth and knocked them around. Yeah, and they're all like individuals, so it's not like a reef, they're individual oysters at some point. Yes? Have you guys seen an increase in how frequently you're having to sink the bags with like this increase in kind of, which is like in the past couple of years, it's been impacted by hurricane every season and we've had a lot of these more users come through? Um, well, we've only been at it for two years and okay. we had to sink in both years. Okay. So, <laughs> and this time around, actually now bringing this back, those were two prior years. Actually, I guess Dorian, we sank them, but I think we should have sunk them for this for this past storm, um, but it just kind of it came up out of nowhere, which yeah. is a coastal storm. And we actually get one of our lines had broken, uh, but I don't think we lost any. Okay. So you know, that's something we should have done. And you do say them just to avoid like physical loss, right? Yes, yeah. we, they would just get away. So our second speaker today is Dr. Uh, Eric Edwards from the uh, Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics to take a sort of a more economical look at, at the impacts of these sorts of events. I'll get this so it's over great. All right, thanks so much. So this presentation is one that I also give to ag producers. Uh, and so, but the area of emphasis is gonna be a little different. Um, so, but you can sort of see see how I talk about these, these issues with ag producers as well. Sort of the idea, it doesn't always go smoothly, but it's always interesting. So um, yeah, so climate change and agriculture on North Carolina. Um, Outline, I'm going to talk about climate in North Carolina and how it's changed. I'm going to go over this pretty quick. There's not going to be a lot of discussion here. You guys know it's changing and it changes. Um, and then we're going to look at how 
Uh, climate change is going to affect crop yields and how economists have been thinking about this. Uh, and then talk about some adaptation uh, in terms of water, which is sort of my area. Probably not going to get the ag land values, but I've never given this to a group that is on board with climate change before. So we'll see how fast I get through this first part. Um, so the big thing about climate and the thing that we've been thinking about, I've been thinking about a lot, and economists have been thinking about, is we sort of have these two changes, right? We have changes in the mean temperature, precipitation, CO2, et cetera, and then changes in the variability of uh, weather itself, right? So um, this chart, I think, does a really good job. This is not about climate that's changing, right? This is about climate that has changed. This is the past 100 years in North, the Southeast since 1901, right? What you see here are the different seasons and the amount of precipitation. So in general, the Southeast has gotten a lot wetter, right? Precipitation has increased by about 30%. Uh, but parts of North Carolina, as you can see, this chart here in the summer have seen decreases in uh, precipitation by up to 30 percent. Right now, this is this is really interesting when it comes to growing something that, on average, we're getting wetter, but during the summer, which is when things grow, we're getting drier. Right, and so this is going to affect crop yield. So you can imagine that it's going to matter both the averages, how the averages are changing, and also how of the timing of dry spells are changing. And in particular, uh, well, so what we're interested in in figuring out what's going on in agriculture is that plants are going to respond to these four different things, among others. But all four of these are very clearly going to be affected by climate change, right? So the temperature is going up, carbon dioxide is going up, uh, solar radiation, if we're getting more water in the atmosphere, solar radiation might be going down, or it depends on weather and how much cloud is there. And then precipitation, that's the big one that might be going up, might be going down, depends where you are, right? Because there's more energy in the system, uh, but it doesn't, it can change weather patterns and things like that. But when we're thinking about crops, we should also be thinking about the timing of the changes. And this is where the variability becomes important. So you can think about a drought in November, if you're growing corn, it's gonna have a very different effect than a drought in May. And in particular, there may be for certain species, certain uh, types of crops, there may be just a few week period when the temperature is really important, right? So I will say that, so as economists, we've been looking at this, looking at how crop yields, not just crop yields, but sort of in general, the aggregate agricultural output is gonna change, but we're somewhere in between one and two, right? There's, there's not a good model for, you know, everything that's gonna happen everywhere. Um, those of you who study climate change, of course, you know that downscaling is a problem. You don't know what's gonna happen in a particular place, but also you don't know what people are doing in a particular place, right? Farmers in this county might be doing one thing, farmers in this county, they're growing different varieties of crops, they're using different mixes of fertilizer and pesticides and water and things like that. So we're gonna to try to account for all that, but we're gonna do it in sort of this, this broad way. Um, so here's some projections, and this, this is the one I like to show to, to producers and saying, I didn't make these projections, I don't even know exactly how they made these projections. This is one set of projections, right? It's not gonna be right, but it's probably closer to what's gonna happen than what we're seeing right now, right? So here's the change in the maximum number of dry days, right? North Carolina is gonna see longer droughts um, under these projections, right? Even as precipitation, especially in the fall, is gonna be going up. Okay, so how are we gonna go about estimating uh, climate change impacts on uh, crops? Well, crops respond to precipitation and temperature, as well as carbon dioxide and things like that, but in sort of these nonlinear ways. So these are aggregate, uh, response functions of different crops, um, sort of a, aggregated across the U.S. Um, from actual data. So we actually observe climate, so we observe weather, um, we observe what the temperature was, the precipitation was that year, 
And you can see how corn, soybeans, cotton, and wheat respond, right? Why am I saying this is an average or aggregate? Why can't we just assume it's one function for each plant? Well, because farmers are doing a lot of different things in a lot of different counties, and they're growing actually a lot of different varieties of corn and wheat and things like that. So it's fairly complicated, but you can see, despite the complexity, the plants show some consistencies, right? Generally, they like it wetter and they like it hotter until they don't, right? And especially, right, in terms of temperature until they die, right? There's these big nonlinear drop offs um, at some point. So if you look at where these temperatures happen, cotton tends to like it hotter for longer, but then there's a big nonlinear drop off. Soybean and corn, they, you typically use the same, approximately the same, same day. So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate these basically these response functions for every county, or that's what economists are going to do, right? And then we're going to look at what happens, and this is, I like this one, because you see what happens to North Carolina, sort of June, July, August average temperature, and then where it goes up to here, right? So you say, yeah, we're hanging out over here. In 100 years, North Carolina is going to be, look, even hotter than Florida. Everyone goes, oh. I don't want to live in Florida. <laughs> Some people do, but right? It's gonna be it's gonna be hotter, it's gonna be different, right? And so if it's gonna be different in all these counties in North Carolina, then how crops are gonna grow in all these counties is gonna be different. And so that's what you're gonna do is take these response functions for every county and say, what if we just change everything? What happens? Right? So what I do is I take the estimates of these these functions, and then we look at what we're growing right now. So these are frequencies. The darker is more frequently grown, and I'm using the big four because we know the most about their response functions, right? Sweet potatoes are, are more complicated, uh, things like that. So a lot of soybeans, corn, there's cotton that's growing up here, but kind of nowhere else. Um, and then let's look at what's gonna happen to these counties right, based on what they're currently growing and what climate's going to do, right? And so these are the yield, produ yield projections, uh, the percentage that ag profits um, are going to be damaged by climate change, sort of in percentage terms, across the state. So you see a lot of heterogeneity even across North Carolina. And what's interesting is for some of these, a lot of these projections, for the US on aggregate, we actually see close to zero or even a little bit of an increase in ag production, ag value being created, but very heterogeneous. North Carolina is one of the losers when it comes to the US, right? One of the, actually one of the biggest losers. Um, I think the third largest in terms of percentage and in terms of aggregate. Um, and then you see the same sort of distribution across North Carolina. Now, these are percentages. So you say, well, we got these red counties back here. I think I was just in this area. There's not a lot this over Thanksgiving. There's not a lot of ag going on out there. So what I've done is I've sort of scaled this by the magnitude of agricultural production that's going on. So you see what's happening is certain areas, in particular the cotton belt, is generally becoming more suitable for growing cotton. So you're getting better yields, larger yields. Whereas other parts of the state are seeing big losses as a result of of these projections of climate change. Um, so a lot of caveats in these projections, but the point I'm trying to make is that there's going to be, there's potentially big changes. So what are some of the caveats? Well, we do a lot of livestock here, that's not like the livestock, right? Specialty crops, now I argue that specialty crops tend to be grown in more niche areas. They need more that's why they're specialty crops, right? The big four are spread across the whole world because they're pretty resilient to a variety of things. So, but we haven't looked at exactly what's gonna happen in tree crops or peanuts or sweet potatoes, but I suspect there's gonna be equal, equally problematic changes. Um, but what we haven't done is looked at adaptation, right? So this is just sort of assuming we're gonna use the same crop mix in the same counties and farmers are just gonna to have to adapt the way they have Right? They're not going to be able to change their adaptation. So 
you know, right now we're seeing kind of weather varying like this and farmers are doing something and we're using that something that they're doing to then project what's gonna happen when the weather starts doing this, right? So what could they do? Well, they could change crops, they could get more resilient crops, they could change practices, et cetera. Um, the big thing that I like to look at is what's gonna happen in terms of water management. Um, so we know what we can do when there's droughts, right? We can start irrigating. Now, usually when we think of irrigation, you think of like Arizona and building a big canal and bringing a bunch of water to the desert so you can grow corn uh, near Phoenix, right? So that's changed, that's addressing the mean issue, right? There's too little water in the mean, so you gotta bring your mean water delivery up. But we've also got the variance issue, right? And so in the East, we've seen over the last 50 or so years, all the increase in irrigated acreage in the US has been in the East, right? And the East, in North Carolina, for instance, just about everywhere, I think everywhere, gets enough water at the mean to grow crops, right? It's not true of the West, but it's true of the East. Uh, but it's this variance that people are starting to address. So we can, we can irrigate. And then dealing with high precipitation events and dealing with excess water as well. Um, so same picture as the slide earlier I, I noted. Um, what are you gonna do about this as an agricultural producer? Probably nothing. Right, your crops ruined. You got to have crop insurance. You can think of that, right? There's no way to get a hurricane's amount of water off of your land in a hurry. But there are ways to deal with shortages and excesses of water, right? So already, about 40% of the cropland in North Carolina requires drainage to be usable, right? So already we have these huge adaptations to climate um, that could be increased. Um, and irrigation, currently about 5% of acreage and 10% of farms are irrigated, but this has been growing, like I said, for the last 50 years in the East and in North Carolina too. So you can sort of see the, the pattern of irrigation, acreage and number of farms irrigated here. And here's a picture of a center pivot with me in the foreground. Um, that's at the Wheeler Lake Farms. Um, and this is a picture of a drainage district. So this is all going on in North Carolina. Right? Here's the drainage ditches. You can either put tile underneath the farm or dig a ditch. Either way, what you're basically doing is creating a channel for the water to flow out. If water flows underground, right, it's flowing out. Um, here's the percentage of crop acres drained in North Carolina right now. So between 60 and 100% of all of these counties, their cropland is drained, right? If you didn't have drainage ditches and tile drains, you wouldn't even be able to farm it. Right. Of course, if we add more drainage, right, we have to get more water off in the fall, uh, we run into the problem of water pollution. Um, so there's ways to deal with that as well, but we shouldn't think that adaptation is going to be priceless either, right? Or costless, I guess I should say. Um, so 50%, 53% of reduction in wetland habitat from 1780 to 1992 via drainage in North Carolina. Um, and then here's the percentage of farms with irrigation. Again, uh, irrigation takes water from something else. I just read an article in the Wall Street Journal about um, how the West's water disputes and water shortages are coming to the East. Um, I don't know if I go quite that far, but there are good, <clears throat> if you start pulling water from one place, that water is not there anymore. So again, irrigation can deal with these droughts, but may be problematic. Um, So, how am I doing? Yeah, a few minutes. A few minutes? Okay. So, what I usually do now is I talk about how uh, climate could affect agricultural land values. So, that we're getting, getting a little more into the economics, right? So, here are agricultural land values per acre in North Carolina. Right? And the darker is more valuable ag land. Right? But you see some interesting patterns, right? Where's the most valuable ag land? Well, here's Wilmington, Raleigh, Durham, Charlotte, right? It's right around the cities. Why is that? Well, ag land is going to have two components to it. One is going to be crop sales per acre, the amount of value you're getting off your land per acre. The other is going to be the opportunity cost or the option value of the land. That is converting it into city, right? So we've got these two, these two potential uses. Five minutes left. 
where is climate change going to affect ag land values, right? Where is that going to come in? Well, it could affect where people want to live, right? It could affect people wanting to live near the coast. But in general, at least the way I view it, people are still going to be moving to Raleigh and Charlotte, things like that. If that's the case, then really where climate change comes in is in crop sales, right? You reduce your crop sales, part of your value of your ag land is reduced, right? So we have this climate change in 100 years. You used to be able to grow a lot of corn on your land. Now you can't, right? Your crop sales per acre go down. But maybe your option value of selling your land doesn't change. And so even though we might see these very large impacts in terms of yearly productive agriculture in the state, the effect on land values and things like that may not be as large, uh, at least due to this agricultural channel. Of course, this part of the state has a whole other set of problems, right, in terms of, in terms of land value. Right? So I will leave it at that. Oh. And um, I will just also note that um, if you're interested in exploring this further, you know, there's probably a lot of grad students. I have a class in water economics that I'm teaching next semester. Uh, and then from the economic side, we have uh, the Center for Environmental Resource Economic Policy, uh, CENREP, and you should definitely uh, check our website and, you know, if you want to get an economist, you want to get in contact with me to get involved in climate-related projects. There's a lot of that. So, and then follow me on Twitter, of course. <laughs> so, a couple minutes for questions. So I, I was actually thinking about right, when you saw the slide, the issue of drainage and nutrients. I, I lived in Illinois for a long time, and, and rain tile is a really good way to get fertilizer off the land into the surface water. <laughs> yeah. So what is that problem being recognized, and are actions being taken, or are we going to have dead zones off of North Carolina? <laughs> um, I, think, I think there are already significant problems with uh, uh, nutrients on, you know, on the Tar Pamlico River and the Deus River both have uh, nutrient trading programs already. So there are, there are already significant issues. As far as the regulatory environment goes, right, the farms are typically not regulated directly. So there's, there's indirect methods of doing that, but they're not, not typically restricted directly in how much fertilizer there are, nutrients they're draining into the water system. In terms of irrigation uh, that's going up with, over time, what is the source of the water for that? Um, Rivers or wells or, or? I don't, I don't, I don't know. The USGS has data on that, but I don't know off the top of my head for North Carolina. Um, you can have, I know in some areas of the east, you just have a little pond on your land and you put water out of that, but I'm not sure what. I wanted to ask what was maybe a most Common sort of pushback you get from the about climate change. Oh, so 100% on what model I'm using for projecting climate change. And I don't know if it's Fox News or what, but every, everyone thinks that they understand and know the assumptions of climate models and can critique. Yeah, so how do you push, how do you, like, I don't know anything about climate models. So <laughs> I just say I'm trying to choose the best peer reviewed models. We know they're not going to be right, but we already see this change over the last 100 years, so we can expect that there's going to be a change going forward, and we're trying to just, what would happen economically if that change were to occur, um, and how could, how could we deal with it? If we start over the next, you know, we have 80 years to adapt. If over the next 80 years, we start to see these changes, well, to the, the challenges of, of the projections, I'm going out 100 years, right? So you have, you have time to make changes, as a farmer, what changes would you make if this is the scenario that you're running into? What would you expect to see? Because if you don't change over the next 80 years, some counties are losing 40, 50, 60 percent of their total ag profits. Yeah. I have a super specific question. Um, you're talking about certain areas with 
the increased temperature than I actually expected to possibly get slightly higher yields in cotton in particular. Um, do you know if in the last couple of years we've seen that? Um, and the, quite, the reason I'm asking is I know just talking to some like local cotton farmers, they've seen a lot of losses due to like rain events. I guess when cotton gets wet too soon after budding, you can't harvest it or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And I think, I think it's the hotter and drier summers are what would probably be driving that. So if the, if the hurricanes come really early, like not this last year, but the year before, yeah. then you can see losses. So cool. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. So our, our third speaker for today, and I guess our last one of the semester for the series, um, is Dr. Kim Berkey from Department of Crop and Soil Science. We'll talk about a, uh, yeah, let me switch this over. Great, thanks. Yeah, thank you. I'm certainly happy to be here. I'm uh, Kent Berkey. I'm a USDA professor in crop and soil sciences. I've been working for uh, a number of years on looking at stress tolerance in crops. My, my training is in physiolo plant physiology and biochemistry, but uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing in probably the last 15 years has been in close collaboration with plant breeders. Uh, so we have uh, appropriated funds from Congress that come to our project every year. Uh, so our mission is to improve the environmental stress tolerance of crops. And at this point, our current five-year plan, we're looking at soybeans and wheat in terms of ozone and heat as the two stress factors. So today I'm just gonna focus on, on soybean because uh, we've made a little bit more headway on that than, than in wheat, but we certainly have got uh, some progress in wheat as well. Um, so what we're doing is we're basically uh, screening germplasm for tolerance uh, and, and feeding that information to the breeders so they can use those uh, genotypes in their, crop, in their uh, developing breeding lines with, those, with enhanced stress tolerance. Uh, as physiologists, we're also working on trying to identify traits that are associated with that tolerance, both in the shoot and the roots, as well as the underlying genes that contribute to stress tolerance mechanisms. And I make the distinction here between traits and genes, because a lot of these uh, traits are really complex, meaning that there's more than one gene involved, more than one pathway, or maybe even more than one mechanism going on. So the idea, it, it'd be very difficult, for example, to target a single gene and expect that to have a big impact. You're getting the impact of a lot of different things, I think. And when you look at the, the QTL mapping of some of these stresses, you'll find that there's maybe six or eight different ones that are sort of highlighted at, at sort of small percentages. So it, uh, that makes it uh, a little complicated. Uh, one of the challenges for doing ozone and heat stress is that you need to have some very specialized uh, infrastructure in order to do those kinds of experiments. So that's one of the things I'll feature today in terms of what we're doing. So uh, a lot of our research is done on the Lake Wheeler Field Lab, the farm just south of the campus. This is sort of an overview of this where we have some different kinds of structures in this area and this area. Uh, these are up in top chambers and these are something we call an air exclusion system. So we, I'll show you sort of close-ups of some of those before we're through today. So this is basically NC State property that's been leased by USDA in a long-term lease. And so this, this site's actually been in operation in one form or another since probably the early 70s. Um, back then they were trying to document problems with uh, impacts of things like elevated CO2 and ozone on crops. We've been through that phase. Now we're in the phase of trying to, what can we do about adapting crops? And so we're using some of the same technology, but we're, our focus is, is now a little different. Uh, a quick little overview of what of ozone, ozone formation, because that's the pollute we're talking about. Basically, uh, a couple of take home lessons. Ozone is actually a secondary pollutant. That comes from the fact that when you burn carbon in various forms, you're getting nitrogen oxides forming. That's a consequence of burning carbon in the presence of air. Some of that nitrogen is getting oxidized. And it's those oxides of nitrogen as well as volatile organic compounds that are going to some fairly complex chemistry to basically convert oxygen O2 into ozone O3. So the point I want to make here, that, which is one that's not necessarily always appreciated, is the fact that once these precursors are in the air and this reaction is going on, it can be 
have immediate impacts around the sources, but it can also be transported a long way. And wherever those precursors happen to be on a warm, sunny day, which is during the growing season, you're gonna get air pollution problems in rural areas that you might not expect. Um, a little overview of ozone impacts. Uh, uh, this is from a paper that was uh, published uh, a couple years ago now, or a, over a year, a modeling study on ozone impacts on soybean production. So this upper panel here is basically what, what, what this group did was to take an ozone response function, as well as other kinds of environmental things that go into the ozone response, and then make predictions about ozone impacts on soybean production so you're only going to see, I mean, you, you get some places you get pretty high levels of, uh, of uh, impacts. So this is looking at places on the planet where, where soybeans is a major crop. So you're not going to see, you may have ozone problems in other places, but if you're not growing soybeans, they're not going to show up here on this map. Um, the bottom one here is sort of, uh, this paper sort of deal with a lot of different environmental stresses. Ozone was sort of a focus, but things like pests and, and uh, pathogens were another one. Things like salinity and, uh, and drought were there. So, because there's not a lot of data on these, I mean, you have, you have to dig into the details of this paper to, to appreciate all this. But basically, as you go up from one to five, you're talking about things that are predicted to have bigger impacts. And so for, for soybeans, you can see there's a lot of impacts in Eastern United States and in South America. Brazil, where, where soybeans are a big crop. Uh, you can see some here in China and India as well. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about um, our research on trying to improve the ozone tolerance of crops. I mean, uh, so the first part we have to do is we have to come up with a screening protocol, screen germplasm. And, what we, and what's known from just early work on, uh, on ozone is that uh, Ozone creates a very characteristic leaf symptom that you can that you can rate in sort of a semi-quantitative way. So what we did initially was take 30 soybean ancestors. These are these are the primary lines that many years ago were collected and brought into breeding programs across the United States. And uh, my colleague of mine, Tommy Carter, who's a soybean breeder, he and his uh, postdocs many years ago went through several hundred lines of uh, soybean varieties grown at that time, and went back to the primary ancestors from which they came from. So out of these hundreds of cultivars, they came back and looked at, came down to about 30 lines that represented most of the genetic diversity that they were seen at that time in the crops. So what we did was we screened these ancestors in a series of ozone chambers that we have out of the Method Road greenhouse. We've got a, a greenhouse today with 20 of these different chambers, so we can set up, look at lots of different genotypes. We're growing them in pots, we can control the ozone concentration in each of these chambers individually. So just to sort of, sh what we did initially then was to give these plants, grow them up to a certain stage where you can see there's got uh, about three or four weeks old, uh, give them a short-term treatment either with no ozone or 75 parts per billion ozone concentration. And 75 parts per billion is gonna be about what you get on a code orange day. Uh, so it's relevant, but it it's, can be high. And basically, this is the range of response that we see. Our, our most, one of our most sensitive, tolerant lines is, is a line called FISCB3 that actually originated in Sweden, was brought to Canada for its cold tolerance, but when we screened it for ozone, it was very tolerant to ozone. And here is, is an example of uh, the injury you get after five days on one of our most sensitive lines that we saw. So you can see there's a tremendous difference in the leaf uh, foliar injury. And so we're using this as our test we're deciding is this a sensitive or potentially a sensitive or a tolerant line. Uh, we then ask the question, is, is, is the foliar injury that we see in the greenhouse, is it related to yield loss of the field? And so what we've done here is that many years ago, sort of like the three generations of scientists ago, developed this technology called open top chamber technology. We still are using that down at the end of the road site. We are growing plants in pots and basically it's a system in which you're having open top chambers where you're bringing air in from ambient air. It's distributed around a double panel wall into the round of plants and then out the top. Uh, because we have ozone problems here, we have air pollution problems here, the question comes up, what are you gonna use for a control if your air is polluted already? And they, they knew that at the time, and they're, they're, the way they dealt with that is they put a charcoal filter in the, in the line here with the, uh, 
with the airflow. So you're basically pulling in ambient air, you're taking out, or at least reducing ambient ozone down to levels that are not effective. And then you can add back whatever ozone level you want to, to get a range of treatments. And basically what we showed from a series of experiments with a lot of different genotypes is that basically early season foliar injury, if it was high, it was associated with yield loss at the end of the season. So what this tells us is that we can use these sort of short-term screening projects in the, in the greenhouse that will give us some idea about which lines to take out and test in terms of their yield response. So the next question is, is that what does it take to move these ozone tolerance traits into elite cultivars? Because a lot of these plant introductions where you may have the stress tolerant traits are terrible yielders. They don't yield very much. They have all other kinds of problems about diseases and lodging and things like that. So what they are is effective sources of tolerance, but they're not very, they're not agronomically practical. Uh, so from this initial work, we found this Fiscal P3 is the source of, of ozone tolerance. Um, it's sort of an amazing little plant because other people have screened it for other kinds of stresses. So it's also a source of drought tolerance and salt tolerance, a number of different stresses. It's, it's somehow unique. We don't exactly understand why, but we think it's probably involved both leaf and root traits, and, and that's still to be determined exactly what that is. But just to give you an idea about this, a little bit, of, just a little thing about leaf physiology. So for ozone to really have the impact it has, it has to be able to get into the plant and react with the mesophyll tissues. Um, so the stomates are critical here. So this is a source of getting ozone in, of getting CO2 in to do photosynthesis, but also releasing water as part of transpiration. So the reason I'm making this point is that it looks, is that this idea of linking uh, ozone tolerance and drought tolerance, we think we may have, uh, uh, we, may, we think we may have found a linkage here, because one of the things about FISCP3 is that it's associated with reduced thermal conductance while maintaining high rates of photosynthesis, meaning the stomates are closed, they're taking up less ozone, so you're getting less of an ozone effect, but yet they're still able to do high rates of photosynthesis, which means you're not getting a, you're not getting dinged on the fact that your carbon fixation rates are low. We don't exactly know what that means. I mean, it's a project that would be good for a student if I could find the funding for it to understand exactly how is photosynthesis or how is, how is CO2 uh, regulated inside of a leaf in Fisca B3 and how is that different than maybe some other crops. So then we'll move on a little bit to just strategies for actually moving these ozone tolerance genes into cultivars that farmers can use. Uh, so we have what we're calling the holiday by Fisca B3 story. So Fisca B3, poor yield potential, but it has ozone and drought tolerance. My colleague, Tommy Carter, and some other people have spent a lot of time making these crosses. So basically they took Fisca B3, crossed it with an elite cultivar called Holiday, and developed breeding lines. And this is very time consuming because you're basically having to take these lines and you develop, have to take them on for about six generations. So you have lines that are consistently providing the same, pretty close to being not completely pure gen genotypes, but you're getting a phenotype that you're getting that's, that's consistent from one time to the next. So he's done that. Um, his next step is to actually take these lines out and then select them in sort of a bulk breeding kind of a thing where you're basically putting out lots of seeds that came from this cross into a field. You go out and select the ones that look like a plant that farmers would grow. And those are the ones that you're maintaining for lines that you're taking on to the next set of steps. Uh, because of this linkage we have between ozone tolerance and drought tolerance, we sort of caught a little bit of a break there. I mean, you, you have to sort of take your luck where you can get it. So basically, Tommy has a, a really big drought tolerance program where he screens things down at the Sand Hills Research Station, which is sort of southwest of here, where basically it's a farm that's basically a big bed of sand. And what happens is if it doesn't rain, you're, you're five days away from a drought at all times. And so he can take these lines down there, grow them out, irrigate if you need to, but you can see which ones are going to be the most drought tolerant. And he uses uh, a slow wilting score. So if you're getting four or five days into a drought cycle, you can go out there and you look at the wilting patterns of, the, of each line and you can tell which ones are holding up better than others. And that's what he's done. So out of potentially, uh, Hundreds of breeding lines, I mean, here's hundreds, he's selected that, these are probably dozens, maybe still a couple of hundred lines. He's been able to identify 14 lines that came out of this cross that show the slow, slow wilting trait down at the Sand, at the Sand Hills Research Station. 
And what we've done, and what we're doing right now, and we've just did our first experiments this summer, so we, we don't really have the data ready to go. But we believe from, these, from using the greenhouse trials, we think out of these 14, we've identified two or three lines that tentatively have the ozone tolerance trait. And so we're gonna be following up on those. So these represent lines that could be breeding lines that, 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 that Tommy could release to, to companies. And they could use these as breeding lines that look pretty good agronomically. They have these stress tolerant traits in them and that go into the breeding program. So that's how our comp contribution is, is that a lot of the lines, a lot of the cultivars that farmers grow are come from seed time. So what we're trying to do is to, is to spend time doing background research on trying to move germ tolerance traits into breeding lines, which the companies are never gonna do. Because, you know, we started this research probably in around 2005 or something like that. So here it is 14 years later, or 15 years later, we're just starting to get potentially products out of that. And companies aren't gonna spend time doing that. So that's, that's sort of what our role is, I think, uh, as far as that goes. Uh, we're also doing some study, beginning some studies about trying to do the same approach for looking at heat stress. So here is from this paper from Gina Mills and, and, and a large group of people, sort of showing where, where it's predicted to have uh, heat, heat stress is gonna be a problem for soybean. And you can see, you know, they're, it's showing up in places that are soybean growing regions. So this is just sort of give you an orientation. I mean, this yield constraint store, score here, you'd have to go back and read the paper to appreciate the details of why it's assigned, you know, one through five. I mean, typically pests are gonna have the highest kind of stress and some of the other ones are less so. This is just to show you though, that there is uh, some expected impacts of heat stress on soybeans. Um, so a little bit of the research that we're doing. For the last number of years, one of our projects is, has been to look at, okay, um, is to look at um, uh, the interaction between heat stress and ozone stress. And so we've got some fairly specialized chambers here in which we can maintain elevated ozone or elevated temperature through the whole growing season and then look at, look at the results at the very end of it. And we think that there is some, some preliminary data we've got here is that there's definitely cultivar differences in terms of the ozone response. Over the years, these early years, we were just sort of getting our feet wet, but we, we were going in line that looked like, if anything, elevated temperature of three to four degrees centigrade might be a benefit to this particular cultivar. And yet the one we've been growing the last few years, it's, it's detrimental. It's, it's an inhib So we think there's genetic variation in, uh, in uh, heat stress. And how we're planning to do this, we're in the process right now of constructing some temperature gradient greenhouses. This is just a couple of pictures from things that are from a couple of weeks ago. Basically, you're bringing in ambient air and using technology that we've developed, we're moving air through here and then adding heat at a couple of different places. So we'll have an ambient, a plus two, and a plus four degrees. So we'll be looking at sort of the, the range of temperatures that were expected uh, in the future. And we'll use this greenhouse for screening lines to determine which ones that, that, that advance to the breeders. So uh, summary, uh, I think one of the points I'd like to take away is that there really is extensive genetic diversity for tolerance in the germ class of collections. I mean, what happens is there, there sometimes there are tens, thousands or tens of thousands of lines in there and basically breeders maybe have used at best 1% of that. So there's a lot of work to be done by doing, by looking for the sources of these. Uh, uh, identifying genotypes with stress tolerant traits and moving these into improved cultivars is, is, is an approach for adapting crops to future climates. And that, one of the things I wanted to do is mining this diversity required an intentional collaboration between geneticists and, and, and plant physiologists. Uh, we're doing the Gen X and then doing the phenotyping to be able to, to screen for them. So um, last slide, Tom and Carter, soybean breeder, David Marshall, wheat breeder, the ones we're working with. Ripley Tisdale, Anna Locke, our, our USDA scientists in, in the crop and soil sciences department, and then uh, Walt Person and Sam Ray are an agronomist and an ag engineer. You can imagine it takes a lot of uh, effort to sort of keep these facilities up and running and uh, the data collected 24 seven when you're running those. So, and finally, just um, funded by your tax dollars, um, uh, United Soybean Board has, has provided, provided us some funding for doing this over time. And NC State is a great collaborator. I mean, these two organizations get a lot of benefit from working together. And with that, uh, thank you very much. So if you had to estimate.
estimate how long it would be before you would be able to confidently say to a farmer, use this, you know, cultivar in, in you know, in future climate because of its heat tolerance. How much, how far are you from being able to make those types of well, recommendations? We would probably never know. Because what happens is, is that the companies are not going to really tell you how, how they've used your germplasm. But I would suspect that if you could provide a breeding line to a company, I mean, here's an example of taking 10 or 15 years. We could probably do this more efficiently now that we know what we're doing. But the companies can take, make back crosses of what you're giving them and have lines out in, in probably less than five years. But it's still a long, it's a, still a long sort of time course there, meaning that you can't wait until the stress is here you're trying to say what we're going to do about it. It's, it's time to, you know, this is the time to sort of think about how to go about approaching that. Yeah, um, I just wondered about the connection between CO2 production and ozone production. You said the ozone is a result of burning fuel, I think. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So as we're all familiar with CO2 going up around the world from burning fuel, but here, I guess would say the ozone is going up as well. And it, problems that you're dealing with are only going to get worse in time as long as we're burning fossil fuel. Is that correct? That's correct. And one of the arguments I get sometimes is the fact that CO2 is actually a sort of stimulates photosynthesis. But the amount of CO2 you'd have to have in the atmosphere to cause the snowbanks to close is, is much higher than what we're predicted. So ozone is always going to be out ahead of this, no matter what the CO2 concentration is. Yeah. Okay, so if we cut CO2, we cut the ozone then as well. Yeah, actually ozone, because of the nature of it, it's sort of a seasonal, periodic kind of thing, but ozone itself is a, is a, is a greenhouse gas force, uh, a forcing greenhouse gas. I mean, it, it, uh, but it's not in the atmosphere. It's, it's seasonal from one time of the year to the, during the growing season, it can change, so it doesn't have quite the impact of something there is all the time. Yeah. Okay, we have one more question. So I work with poultry and soybean bean is uh, the major cooking source we use in, in poultry rations. Um, the two main anti-nutritional factors that we look at are the trypsin inhibitors and the amount of phytate in the soybean. Would the genetic selection to improve the ozone resistance and the drought resistance affect those factors or do you plan on protecting those? Um. Well, what you're trying to do, I mean, if, if you've got, you, what you'd be looking for is a, is a cultivar that has the nutritional traits you want, and then look to move these traits in. I, I think uh, what, what, what goes on in the seed and what's going on in the atmosphere is not necessarily directly connected, but if a plant's under stress, it's conceivable that the composition of the seed is going to be affected by that. So it's possible it's something to keep up with. I, don't, I would predict that yield it's going to be impacted more than seed quality. You know, and being able to protect yields would be a bigger part of this, I think. Well, thank you so much. And thanks, Dollar. And yeah, that's, uh, thanks to the uh, Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center for sponsoring the seminar series. And we'll have three more talks next year, next semester, February 6th, March 5th, and April 9th. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for emails advertising those. And yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming out. Good.